in uh, uh, Facebook land. Uh, we are studying the book of Ephesians, and our, I guess our mantra, for want of a better term, is, is from Christ, in Christ, and uh, for Christ. And um, I'm going to actually just do a bit of a, a pull through from the last few weeks to set us up for what we're looking at today. And uh, so let me do that by... Um, uh, is this working? Is there a little Google app as well? Um, so today we're going to look at chosen and adopted uh, by God. And um, we've got a picture of a dog and a horse there. I don't know how clear that is about beautiful uh, uh, data projector there. Um, and this is a story actually of, a, of an African elephant that was rescued, um, I think it's about 32 or 35 years of age there. Uh, as a young uh, pup elephant uh, by the by poachers and, and they rescued this, the, the parents have been taken. And it's in South Carolina of all things now. And uh, there's a black Labrador where they call Bella and they've become the best of mates. They both love the water. They, if you go on YouTube, they'll be jumping off each other and all that sort of thing. And, and for most of these types of stories, and I, as a, I don't know about you guys, I'm fascinated by them. Um, the only one I don't agree with is dogs that like cats. I think that's kind of wrong. You've got to draw a line somewhere. But there's a, it's the most unlikely of relationships, isn't it? And um, the dog and the elephant somehow have found each other. And you can almost say it's this mutual relationship or mutual uh, adoption. And there's some classic pictures of these two with the dog sitting, the elephant's down with the leg and the dog sitting on the leg like that, just looking out. Like they are literally the best of... Uh, best of mates. But what I want to talk about today with you guys is um, something very different, something very unlikely, but even very different to this. And that is that the adoption that we have been adopted into in, into um, is really only being done by one partner. Uh, where if we could look at this example, both parties were interested and keen and, and put up with each other. But in some respects, as we know of our relationship with our Heavenly Father, it was certainly uh, one way. And our adoption also is not like this where we've, oh, you can't really see that, can you? I'm so disappointed. It's an elephant uh, we're sort of merging with a dog face there. And it's not like as Christians that we, we were human and, and now we're more Christ-like, therefore we're kind of half and half. And we know from Scripture, we know from the Gospel that we are all in Christ. In fact, when God the Father looks at us, he sees uh, the righteousness of Christ. So let me just spend some moments pulling through what we've been looking at. I think it's important. Um, last week we looked at that God is blessed and he's also the blesser. He is also the blesser. Uh, all blessings are spiritual. And uh, the, the word spiritual there in our English is always only used in reference to the Holy Spirit. So these blessings are spiritual in nature. These blessings are sourced or given by the Holy Spirit. And that's not to mean that material possessions or things that we have aren't from God, everything is from God. Um, but certainly as Christians, we tend to as humans go and look for how can I be blessed with a home or a car or something, uh, where Paul in Ephesians 1 is just talking about all these other uh, blessings. Now, we are jumping into Ephesians, which is one of those grand books. And I think it's important, as we did last week, to consider um, who God is and that and what type of God is God when we say he's the God of the universe? And remember this diagram we've been looking at. Perfectly loved from before time, glorified in eternity to come, and grace and peace is ours uh, because of the cross. And we have blessing upon blessing as the, uh, the original language would uh, share that. Now, let's think about this amazing God for a moment. How can God offer such great blessings? I shared a few examples of if I was a gazillionaire and I decided that I was going to look after somebody here, I can't remember who I used last week, but let's just say it's, uh, who can I pick on? Let's say Nav, I'm not picking on him, but I say to Nav, I'm going to pay your mortgage, I'm going to give you a car, in fact, you don't have to work, I'm going to give you everything you've ever wanted, you just tell me I've got so much money you don't pay. He's going to go, this is all right. No, I'm a human, I could get sick or bored. I could go bankrupt and I couldn't fulfill those promises, even if I was the richest person. But there'd be something that would stop that or could stop that. We know that's not the case with God. When he offers us, us blessings, when he says he will do things, he will do them because he is God. Firstly, because he's omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is able 
to do the things that he says. He's omniscient. He's, he's um, all-knowing. There's nothing that he does not know. He's omnipresent. In other words, he is everywhere uh, present. And he's able to interact with his creation any point in time, as he chooses. He's immutable. What does that mean? He's unchanging. So when he says he's going to do something, he does not change from that. He does not change from that because his word is the very essence and being of who God is. He is omnipotent. He is all-knowing. He is everywhere present and he does not change. And that goes for his love as well. His love is perfect. His love is unchangeable. His love is eternal. So whilst I might often have this great life-changing transformation of him where he's just got everything he ever needs, my love for him as a human might change. I might think, well, I actually like, actually like Daniel over here. He's going to help me with my computer later because I've got some problems. I, think I'm going to, I might try and give him something as well. But God's not like that. He doesn't change on a whim. He can't change because he is God. And sometimes, I don't have it up on the screen, but we talk about a, a, a characteristic of God is that God is simple. You might have remember reading that in the book club. God is simple. And I remember when the first time I saw that as a young I think, what does that mean? That sounds a bit condescending or a bit uh, flippant. But God is not the sum of all these attributes, let alone others that we can define. God is not the sum of all of them. Like they all add up 20% love and 20% justice and 30% of this and 15% power. No, no, no. He is all love. He is all powerful. He is all known. In God dwells all power, all knowledge, all goodness, all love, all mercy. And that's hard for us humans to, to comprehend, isn't it? We might be a loving person, but if someone pushes the right button, we can get to be rather unloving. But God doesn't change like that. So it's really wrong to say that God is unloving when he is all love. And some of all this, we might say, are those eternal decrees that were given before time. Uh, that are unchanging, that are all loving, and they're able to be carried out. So in him, we might say, dwells all good and all good things. So that when he does something, when something occurs, it is perfect and good and loving. We may not see that, but that is the mystery of God, isn't it? That is the deliberate wisdom and decree and purpose of God. Now, we're all reading um, Ephesians 1 there, I think it was 11, it says, In him we have attained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And that the, the word there for counsel isn't like if you sit on a board or, a, or something like that and you make decisions for a sports club or a school or a company, oh, should we do this and everyone's that? No, no, no. This is his deliberate wisdom, God's decree. It means his purpose of his will, his ordained will. So that's encouraging for us as Christians when things don't go how we want them to, that our God is all-powerful, he is all-knowing, he is everywhere present, he does not change. When he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he will never leave you nor forsake you. You might feel like that at times, subjectively, and that's natural living. that he will never leave us because he's able to carry out the very things that he said uh, he will do. We also look then at uh, what has God blessed us with? God has chosen us from before time, we read in verse 4. He has adopted us. He has redeemed us. He has redeemed us. He picked us up. The language there was around slavery. We were a slave to sin. Now we are in Christ. In fact, Paul uses the term at times that we're slaves uh, to God in that sense, but in a positive way, we might say. Forgiveness of sins. The slate has been clear, clean, completely. Not just that we're no longer in slavery, but our, 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 the things that we've committed and the nature that we have has been clean. It's slate as far as the east and from the, rest, uh, the west. And the rest, you could say. Revelation of God's purpose. We know the big picture now. We see that. We see when things go right in the world, that's part of God's purpose. We see when things go wrong, that's all part of God bringing things together. We also have that blessing of being sealed with the Holy Spirit, an official seal that says we are God's children. And not just that, but we have an inheritance. So that brings us to verse uh, 4 and 5 and 6 that we're going to look at today. 
And simply the title of today's talk is Chosen and Adopted by God. Next week, uh, this is sort of like part one, next week I'm going to do what we might call a lerman. Has anyone heard the term lerman? It's not a sermon, it's not a lecture, but it's going to be a lerman. Um, so this sort of subject, we're looking at God choosing people before time. Some people call it a lecture, there's other terms, predestination, which is all through here. I want us to see that today, what that, it's not, that's not the end game. That's not the end goal. That somehow in the deep mysteries of God, which we don't understand as humans, things were decreed before time. I'm living now. I have to make choices now. I have to make decisions now. The Bible says I've got to make decisions. The Bible says I've got to make, uh, choose uh, the right way and choose the gospel, if you know what I mean by that. So next week I want to sort of unpack that in more detail and really uh, get into it. But for tonight, today I just want to look at verses 4, 5 and 6, uh, that we were chosen and adopted by God the Father. Let me read those verses again. Now we see in verse 3 that it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual, you imagine, cost, the, the, it, talking about the Holy Spirit in that sense, uh, and blessing. And that we know that that word blessing is where you hear the word eulogy, that in English we might use, putting praise or commending others. Verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which, which, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. There's so much in this passage here. There is so much in this passage. Let me just, um, did I open in prayer? I did? Okay, good. I just got, and Seth, you all right with everything here? All right, good, good. You realise he was still laying slides while we were singing, so. So he's done well. we get the team award today. All right, good. Um, so I'm obviously a bit lost myself, so, but we're cool now. All right, so let's look at this. Verses 3 through to 14, as Noel read, in some respects describe the grand plan of God, the master plan for salvation. And we can look at that in God choosing people in 36, uh, the redemption in 6 through to 11, and then up to 14 there, the, the future, the inheritance. You could also look at the Father's work in those three sections, uh, the, the, the work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. So with that in mind, let's just think about where we're heading now. I'm going to get four main things I want to explore to you. What does it mean to be chosen before time? What is the purpose of God's sovereign choice? What is the outcome of God's choice? And what is the motive? What is the reason God is doing this? What is the reason Paul is saying here? And I know, uh, even in my own walk with the Lord, these are things I've had to come to terms with as well. And you might be on that scale as well. So we're just looking at this as a church, as a family. And I'm very open. I'm, in fact, I'm going to send out a little uh, questionnaire during the week to, for people to give me questions because there's lots of things fall out of this type of doctrine, we might say, and we need to make sure that we're, we kind of get all that and, and, we, and we can set ourselves on a pathway to understand more. But acknowledging all along the way that, my goodness, can I understand the mind of God? They say we only use 5% of our own brain here. Uh, in God's eyes, it's probably even less. But let's have a look at this. What does it mean to be chosen before time? Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, we might say. That word chose there um, simply um, uh, is a Greek word that indicates, uh, it's used to describe, the tense could be described as a God's total and independent choice. And that is, God not only chose um, by himself, with no external factors to consider, but for himself. And the way that the language is used in the original is giving that sense, the particular way that Aristotle is used there. In a strict sense, it was all for him, in his doing, in his timing, for his glory, as we see in verse 6. In fact, in verse 11, you can see that as well, according to the purpose of human works, all things according to the counsel of his will. And uh, you can even read that in verse 14, to the praise of his glory. God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, in many respects, Paul is positioning is not as a question or an argument, but just a statement because that's why he writes these things. 
We know that Genesis 1 1, just to segue, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It wasn't a question, it wasn't an argument. And as we try and understand this thing, and I feel a little um, uh, undone because I want to explore more of this particular notion next week when we can really get into the nitty gritty and I want to keep moving through the verses. Um, but we know in Romans there's that those who be predestined, he also called, those who be called, he also justified, and those who be justified, he what? He also glorified. From go to woe, we might say, or go to woe to go again, keep it so. So, how do we understand this? Why does God in and of himself have to choose people if we can say that? And one of the important factors we need to consider is that the doctrine of sin is important in our understanding. We are dead in sin. God looks down at us and sees, if I could be frank about it, filthy, rotten, rebellious sinners. And we only need to go to Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 to see that, or Romans 3 to see that. But I am dead in sin, but God has made me alive. In verse 4 of chapter 2, it says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. I could imagine these new Christians at Ephesus just being completely gobsmacked by that concept. We can't can live good Christian lives here, can't we? In our good Christian families, and our, our, a lot of us, my kids included, go to good Christian schools, and, and it's kind of easy. But when Paul says that we were dead in sin and, I, and he walked away with the prince of power of the air, they're going, that was me. I was a temple prostitute. I was a priest. I, was a sil- I, I went to the prostitutes two, three, four times a week. That was me. I needed someone outside of me to do that. And if we understand the doctrine of sin that we, my human will will only ever choose sin. We'll only ever choose sin. In Romans 3 it says, There is no one righteous, no, not one. There is no one who seeks after God. That's quite scathing, isn't it? That's quite scathing. We're born dead. We're unable to do anything. Well, what's the upside of God in eternity at some point, which we don't really comprehend, choosing us before the foundations of the world? The upside is now I can choose Him. I was once dead. But now I am alive. I am now able to choose him. And the new creation chooses God. The new creation chooses to obey God. Jesus said, I will know you my disciples and people will know you my disciples if you follow me, if you obey my commands. I can do that now because I'm not stuck and enslaved in sin. I choose to obey. I choose to love. I choose to be holy because God has enabled that. God has enabled that. Let me just keep going for a little bit on this before we move on. Just a bit of a teaser for next week. We see the emphasis of God, sovereign control and choice over all things, don't we? We see him doing that at a national level, we might say, or a federal level in the way that he chose Israel. If you are a people holy to the Lord your God, in Deuteronomy 7, the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. We see that same language used of us as well, don't we? Out of all the peoples that are on the face of the earth, and you know we just did a study on Deuteronomy and Home Groups where God is saying, hey, don't think you guys took through those, don't think you guys are good. You were rotten. You've been sick neck and rebellious since the day I pulled you out of Egypt. Now I'm emphasising that a little bit, but the tone of it just sounded like a father saying something to their son. When you go into this promised land, don't think it's because you're mighty or good or you're blessed and you're special. In fact, you were the opposite. And Isaiah 45, it also says, it talks about Israel as my chosen. So God has chosen in the Old Testament a nation unto himself. We see it at a personal level. In John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. In Acts 13, 48. Let me just read that to you. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. It's strange, isn't it? As many as those who were appointed. 
And the Greek word there, actually, the King James that, that does a really good translation says, I, I think it's a bit deeper, says ordained. Ordained. As many words are ordained to eternal life, believe. And the original language there, the Greek is saying, it talks about assigning or placing position or appointing. It was often used in military uh, language as well uh, for commissioning for a particular status or purpose. So it wasn't just like, oh, yeah, you'll do, you'll do, you'll do. There's some, some deliberation, some, some method uh, and some thinking uh, there. Uh, but then if we try to understand what that means in God's eyes, uh, from God's perspective, it's very hard for us to, to get ahead around that. We won't do this today, but if you go look at Romans 9, 10, 11, particularly 9, where it talks about um, Jacob and Esau, the older will serve the younger. Verse 11 says, In order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him he calls. And we know that Esau was the oldest, so in, under that custom it should have been Esau. Not because of works, not because of what your culture says or what you think is right, but because uh, God has decided to do that. We also see the negative of this in Revelation 13, 8, where it says, speaking of the, of the beast in the end times, and all who will dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name, listen to this, has not been written in the book of life, but you know what it says just in between that? Has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb was slain. And Re uh, Revelation 17 talks to that end as well. All those who are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world uh, will marvel to see this beast. Now, before we move on, and I've just sort of, we all know this stuff, but I've just sort of downloaded some examples which we'll explore next week because I think we need to understand and wrestle with this and what it means for us living in this world as humans, all with the Holy Spirit. God's sovereign choice, what we call predestination or election, does not operate from or nullify man's responsibility to believe in Jesus as Lord and Saviour. This doctrine revealed by God was never meant to remove my responsibility from my own soul. Does that make sense? We see in Scripture, and we'll look at this, parallel passages. We are accountable. Every man, woman, and child is accountable unto God. And some of the arguments against this doctrine is, oh, well, then I can just do what I want because I'm either chosen or not. Well, no, that's not what we see from Scripture. The gospel goes out to all. It is not limited. We do not share the gospel with only those with the word election on their forehead if we want to get silly about it. I don't see people walking down the stairs from the station there and going, nah, nah, they look chosen. That's not the type of person you've got. It's not the case. It's just not in the psyche to think that way. Romans 10, 9 says, If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and God is raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not whether you're of this race or that religion, that denomination, or you can think hard enough. You will be saved. Matthew 28 and Acts 1 tells us to go out into all the world and call everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only God son that whoever, not a nation or denomination or culture or ones I think are good, Whoever believes. I think that's encouraging because when I go out and I'm talking to people, like you talk to people, you know that you're sowing seed and you know that God will call those that are his. I don't understand it, but I accept it. What is the purpose of God's sovereign choice? What is the purpose? We see this the end of verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Remember this passage was one long sentence. So some people say before him in love, or some people pick up the in love uh, for the next verse if we have it uh, set up before us now. That's what is the purpose that we should be uh, holy and blameless before him. There's similar language used of the church, isn't it? And uh, of Christ. In 1 Peter 1 it says, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Because Christ was unspotted, because Christ was unblemished, because he was the perfect sacrifice. Now, now, we can also be holy and blameless. Unblemished, as the original language would describe it. 
In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, uh, He made him, so God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. My goodness. <laughs> it's not just that Jesus died for us, he's a good guy. What a good thing to do. And you hear that, don't you? People say that. What a great example. No, 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 no. Our sin was imputated, was in, put into Christ. He bore that. As we sung that last song, he bore the wrath of God. And not just that, it's, it, it's, a, it's a double upside. <laughs> Our sin has been removed and the guilt and the fear and the doubt and the failure that it brings us. And now we have the righteousness of God. We are now declared holy. We saw in verse 1 to the saints, Hagios again there, without spot, no stain of sin, no longer under power of sin. God is not running you down saying, I remember you five years ago. He's not doing that. We are his children. We have gathered saints. In fact, we get similar descriptions there in 527 in Ephesians where the church is described, God is, um, God is describing through Paul that Christ is bringing his church, us gathered saints, to be unspotted and unblemished. How beautiful is that? If you're struggling with stuff right now, know that God is doing a work in you to present you one day unspotted and unblemished. But you know what? It's not like just one day and I've got to look forward to that. It's now as well you are declared righteous. That's what justification means. It's just a legal term to say that we've been declared righteous. God declares us holy because of the work of Christ in our faith that we have put in him. And this must reflect, in some respects, holy living. What's the outcome of God's sovereign choice? What, what's the result of this choice of God? And remember, this God's sovereign choice, I'm going to explore that uh, next week with you all in my first of a kind learning. I didn't make up that term, by the way. Let me read verse 5. What's the outcome? In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons, and you can obviously say daughters, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. You haven't got it up there, the verse, but I'll, I'll, I mean, I've got half this verse on lines of key words here. In love. What sort of love? Conditional love? I'm over Nad now. He doesn't really love that money I'm giving him. He's a bit rude to me sometimes. I'm going to spend some on this guy over here. No, 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 no. In love. Agape love, pure and simple. It's not an emotion. It's really, you could describe it as a, as a disposition of the heart uh, to proactively attend to others who don't deserve it. And we're told to demonstrate that same love, aren't we? We're told to show love to others that we don't necessarily like or enjoy. We're told to show love to our enemies, those who might be mocking us or making fun of us or seeking to destroy us, whether that's personally or in careers or whatever, we're told to love our enemy were told to seek them out. In love he predestined. That word there is just means to be predetermined or, or marked out. So in Gapay love, he has marked us out. That's not where it ends. And uh, there's a term that some Calvinists describe other Calvinists as they get this cage stage. Where they get so excited about the doctrines of grace that they realise God is so amazingly awesome and altogether different and it's so exciting, and it's all his work, and they stop there. Did you know that? Da, 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 da. Did you know this? Did you know that? Did you know you're elected? And they forget that's just half the story. Not that God's got half the story. But we were marked out as adoption unto himself as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. Not through our good works, not through our intelligence or our desperation, no, what does it say? Through Jesus Christ. Stop for a bit. Think about that. Adopted to himself. I've shared in the previous weeks that there's no other religion that I can understand as lots of them that says that, like we say, that I am in Christ. And the scriptures keep saying that. As Ephesians said, in Christ, in him, in Christ, in him. No one says they're in Buddha. No one says they're in Muhammad or Allah. It's a wonderful privilege, isn't it? And we've been adopted. We can cry out, as we explored a couple of weeks ago, Abba Father, that language of, of, of Daddy or Papa. 
We cry out, Abba, Father, we have that privilege, we have that relationship. And the ultimate sign of that love is the Father decreeing that Christ would come. Remember we explored the aspects of the Trinity before time? The unchangeable, triune God and functioning, laying out what would happen, that Christ would come. We read in Acts 4 there that Jesus was ordained before time to do what he did. It's not like Garden of Eden, day three or whatever day it was, and oh my goodness, what happened here? I thought this might happen. I've got a plan. No. It might be insane or hard to understand, but the scriptures said that was ordained before time. And I'm pretty sure Adam and Eve were here after time. I don't know, I might be wrong. In 1 Peter 1 20 says he was born not only for the foundation of the world. But God doesn't stop there. It's not just that his great love sent Christ to die for us, but he continues to love us. We see that according to the purpose. I think the King James might say pleasure, which is probably a good way to write it as well, actually. Probably, uh, they can use it interchangeably according to his pleasure or delight or kindness. The word would be used uh, in other writings and other parts of scripture. Uh, the kind intention of his will. Uh, would be a good way to describe it. So according to the kind intention of his will, his desire. And we saw this word will, didn't we, in verse 1 there, Paul and Apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And that will just simply means that, uh, for the Amos, means just determination or choice, inclination. The very determination of God, his choice, his way, his time. Will before time. And it has to be his will. Why? Because when I'm dead in my sin, when I'm uh, trapped in my sin and I'm in a, a slave to it, there's no one righteous. No, I'm unable to choose him. Unable to. My will is not to choose God. My will is to turn away from God. My will is to throw my fist in the air to God. You see that quite clearly in Romans, don't you? So the outcome of God's choice is that we are adopted to himself. If you're on Facebook uh, in our private page, I sent out, was it on the private? No, it was on the public. Um, a three-minute clip on some uh, people being uh, a new baby coming into a family, and the family was a, a traditional family with a, a few other kids as well. It's just beautiful. I think Kathy was watching it. Where is that? She's teaching. I was watching it. She was quite moved with it. I'm laughing because every time I watch it, I but no one sees me because I watch them on my own. But it's just beautiful. And later, not now, Seth, but later, we're going to show a 90 second clip. I just want to get across what it means that we've been adopted. And not just, phew, I'm in. I'll find a nice, cosy corner in heaven. I'll be cool for the rest of whatever. No, 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 no. You've been adopted. <laughs> You've been brought over by the will of God, the very determination of God. And what is the motive for God choosing us, if I could say it so bluntly? We see there in verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. We've been made sons and daughters, children, by the sacrifice of Christ, set up before time, marked out before time, that I might have a really good life here in Australia and find good parking spots when I go to the beach. And I might get a really cool job I might have the best wife who never argues with me. You've got a right to argue with me. That's not what it says, does it? We made sons and daughters for what? To the praise of his glory, his grace. And that's beautiful in itself because if we've been adopted, if we've been, uh, if Christ has taken that sacrifice, we've been chosen and adopted for God's glory, my goodness, doesn't it not elevate who we are in God's eyes? Not my own good. But I'm here for reasons way bigger than a good parking spot or a good career. I'm here for reasons that give God all glory. Have you thought about this, that all creation gives God glory except who? Well, the fallen angels, the demons and the non-believer, because the non-believer, it says, is unable to give God glory, does not choose God, in fact, turns away from God and wants to run from God. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork, it says in Psalm 19. Demons are condemned, and the unsaved are dead in their sins, but when God regenerates their heart, when the Holy Spirit draws us 
and makes us alive. My goodness, we're a new creation by the Holy Spirit. And this new creation can join the rest of creation, really, around us with the ability to truly praise and honour God. Does that make sense, guys? Can you see the depth of that? Can you see the significance of that? That we have been grafted in, we've been adopted. Not just the number we find out, as I said, a cosy car in heaven, but we are God's children to the praise of His glory. I'm so glad you didn't say we've been adopted and made sons and daughters uh, for our own benefit because we fail if we have to try and keep that. It's for His glory. And He is immutable. He cannot change. He's not going to let us fail in that sense. His work will be carried out. He will complete the work which He created. You know, in, in Matthew there, uh, where Jesus says, I'm not too sparrow sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground unless the Father knows. Then Jesus says, uh, Therefore you are more value than many sparrows. And I used to read that as a kid, oh yeah, that sounds cool. <laughs> but I just thought, oh, of course I'm worth a bit more than a few sparrows. They're everywhere, they're, they're a pest to you. It's not, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, don't you get it? You are of, in, of extrinsic and intrinsic value to God. Christ has come. You have more value than many sparrows. You're more value than anything. Christ himself came. So when we see to the praise of his glorious grace, the work of Christ was to bring us to God, reconcile us back to him, that we might praise and glorify him. God gets the glory in that, not me. And it's an awful, awful scenario to see when people are arrogant about their Christian walk and they look down on people who don't know the Lord, forgetting that it was God's grace and God's love and God's mercy that did all that, not mine. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved, that blesses to make grace or endow, bestow grace and kindness upon someone. That's what God has done for us in Christ, in the beloved one, in the beloved. What do you think? Do you think we forget that? (laughs) I do. I kind of live my life, I try and do the right things, and at times I forget that I'm in the beloved. And I treat other people as if they're not in the beloved, realising that I'm not acting that same way myself. The grace of God should just rattle my cage and say, shame, see what you have in Christ, see what he has done for you. Let me just close off our time together today. Oh, I've gone over, right? Oh, I'm missing a slide. That's all right. Um, let me just close off. But first, before I do that, next week we're going to look at definitions of what this means, predestination, chosen, etc. Other viewpoints, how we can engage with them. Um, the objections to that. Um, the scriptural evidence for our position. The theological evidence. Obviously, they're different. Scriptural is more about the the plain sweeping of the scriptures where theological we look at the character of God and who he is and how those things engage. But for now, let's celebrate that we are now in Christ. We have been adopted. I'm going to read Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 and then I'm going to throw to Seth in a minute and I'll actually point him that way because we're professionals. And (laughs) just soak this up, guys. I know I I probably labour Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 a little bit because that's where we're at because we're heading up that in verse 1, uh, uh, in, in chapter 1. Let me read this. And, and consider where you were before Christ. Okay? And, and, and contemplate whether there was any good in you that could actually somehow appease God and His standard of holiness and righteousness. And at the same time, uh, for those who aren't Christians, consider that. This is you right now. You might be the, the kindest gentlest, most loving person in Australia. But if you don't know Christ, this is you right now. Okay? It might sound a bit out there, but I can't argue with Scripture. And you, verse 1 in chapter 2, were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. So this is talking about a Christian now, but following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working the sons of disobedience, so it's active and it's regurgitating and it's expanding, 
among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh or the desires of our flesh. It was just part of us and we couldn't help it. Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath. That was our nature. <laughs> our nature was to be in angry disposition against God, just like the rest of mankind. What does that say? What is that saying? We were lost. We were dead. Always in rebellion. The one who knows us best, our creator. The one that could care for us best. The one that loves us best. We could do nothing to bridge that gap because of our state. All our good works, the scripture said, are like filthy rags. And I want you to watch this 90 second video and we're scared about the sound. That's about 90 seconds, about a young child who's just found out she's been adopted. And I want to read the rest of Ephesians 2, 4 to 10. So just watch this. Contemplate your adoption unto the Father. All right, there's one more guess. It's not the baby, but it's, yeah, it's another guess. I'll see you. Careful with it up. I want you to read it. I'm going to be That moving. <laughs> Think of her own situation. She seemed like a good kid. We weren't good. We were dead. How blessed must it be when we consider that? And even God Himself says that we are blessed. He is the blesser. How wondrous it must be for Him. We see, we read in Scripture it says that. The angels rejoice in heaven over one sinner who repents and then is adopted. Let me read verse 4 through to 10, and then I'll just close off. But God, being rich in, oh, I can't read this, <laughs> in mercy. Now, because of me, because of the great love which He loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, we were dirty, rotten, filthy. We were rebelling against God. He has made us alive with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're not there yet, but Scripture says you might as well be. <laughs> you are seated in the heavenly places. In who? Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And what's our response to this in verse 10? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. In case you're wondering how sovereign God is, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are His glory. I remember the day when I embraced, when it whacked me like a bus, my inability to appease God. I grew up in a Christian family. I was a pastor's kid. 
If anyone's got a leg up, it's me, isn't it? The day that grace hit me, it just wrecked me. And there's so much joy. So much joy. Do I understand it? No. Do I understand the decrees from before time? The secret things belong to our Lord. It says in Deuteronomy 29. That God is rich in mercy. And what confidence and assurance I get from this that it's not me. I don't have to keep hanging on. Yes, I've got a job to do. Yes, I've got to live a holy life. Yes, I need to be kind and loving to others. But I do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. I do that through the revealed word of God. I'm not in this on my own. God has decreed it. God has delivered it. And God will continue to do it, we might say. It's from Christ, in Christ and for Christ. So if I consider that it's all of God and he will not only save me but sustain me and I'm seated in the heavenly places, what does this mean? How does this define me? We know it's not my ability or inability. It's not external things that have happened to me or will happen to me or external things that I've done to others. I am in Christ. So in the the vertical relationship, we are in Christ. We can obey him and love him and serve him and glorify him. And horizontally, if we play out what God's grace means, it's not about knowing some academic theoretical principle in the Bible. It's about living it. God's grace drives me to agape love others, to treat others with humility and kindness, to be patient and tender. The way I treat my spouse and my children and my neighbour. The way Christ died for them as well. I'm not better than them. Christ is better than me. He is the one. It's the grace of God. And we are saved to God's glory. And we are adopted. (laughs) Every day we should have the same response as that young girl and say, I'm adopted? By God, I've done nothing. It's His glory, guys. It's His grace and love and mercy to us. He has saved us. And He will continue to sustain us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. I tell you, that should give you so much confidence and assurance. Not in yourself, but in God who ordains all things. Before I close in prayer, let me just... uh, point to the song we're going to sing, Christ our hope in life and death. We have hope on this side of glory. We have hope to come. It's all what Christ has done. And when we sing that hallelujah part, I want to hear you sing that. I want to hear you sing hallelujah. I am, don't sing this part, and know that I'm adopted, yeah, by the grace of God and God alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love, your mercy, your kindness, your patience. But Lord, thank you for your grace, your disposition to us who did not deserve it. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Father, thank you for that. Thank you that it's your work done your way. And Lord, we don't understand some of that, and we're not meant to perhaps, Father. At, at a significant level, but we know and accept that you have a daily or things. You do not change, and your decrees do not change, and your plans and purposes will go forth. Your word does not return void. And Lord, um, in response to that, Lord, may we not get all excited about that in an academic way, Lord, but may we live in the light of that, that we won't give in, Father, to the natural man. We won't give in to the fears and failures and the doubts and concerns. <laughs> that will give ourselves over to Christ and Christ alone and live under him, live in grace and love and patience and tenderness to others that they may see you as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.